Good afternoon, everybody. I think we are ready to start uh, the next session. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I um, want to welcome you to a session looking at stem cell banking and registries. We have five speakers, so um, we're gonna, I'm going to just assume a role of a moderator instead of giving a formal speech. I would just like to say a few words to introduce the context. STEM banking and registry is premises on the basis of scientific integrity. An essential prerequisite for scientific integrity is vouching for the ethical and legal provenance of the samples that those banks and registers collect, distribute, and use for research, but as well as the data associated with those samples. So as we hear the, the presentation, the speakers, remember there is a context in which you would have to vouch for the provenance, for the informed consent, and for an ever evolving uh, complex system in which the data associated with the samples, the genetic information associated with the samples, is highly regulated under privacy legislation. To add to the puzzle of a complex legal policy frame, a legal framework that governs not only the derivation of the lines and how you store them in a repository, but how you distribute it internationally and how can you do it in a harmonized way. So with much to do, I'd like to introduce Professor Andreas Cruz from the Charité uh, University in Berlin and the lead of the European Human Embryonic Stem Cell Registry. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, thank you, Rosario, for the nice introduction. So I would like to present uh, the European Human Embryonic Stem Cell Registry, which was established in 2007 as an embryonic stem cell registry. And the reasons are multifold, and things have changed since, since 2007, so now we call it hum Human Pluripotent Stem Cell Registry, because other cells are now available as CNT cells, IPS cells, uh, and others, which are pluripotent. Um, but we, changed, we didn't change the, the uh, acronym, because a Spanish woman in our consortium insisted on keeping this acronym, and you don't argue with Spanish women <laughs> if you don't have to. Um, can I change the slides? Okay. Um, yes, what, what should be, in general, the role of a registry for embryonic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells? So there are basically several compartments. One is, one is of course, the cells themselves. They are in banks, they are derived in institutions or, or by laboratories, and uh, we want to know which cells are available. So this is the main function of the registry, to show which cells are available. And then there's information about these cells. We want to know what kind of information do we have for each cell line. So this information in, includes origin of the cell, so where does it come from, what is the donor uh, of this particular cell line, what is the genotype, what is the ethic background of the donation of these cells. So all these issues uh, should be available in a registry and we provide this information and then there is the other part, the user. So what does the user want? The user wants, of course, to know which cells are available and what kind of information do I have for these cells. And they want to work with these, this information, so we need, also need to provide some analysis tools, comparison tools and other tools to work with, the, uh, with these cells. Um, does that work? Next slide. Okay, so what would be, and this is, was a set out, uh, the reason, the main reason for the, regist for, for the European Commission to found a registry, to establish a registry where risks which were uh, pertinent if there's no registry. And the first which is there's uh, a lack of review of existing lines. As you know, in 2007, when the registry was established, there was a lot of discussion about ethical discussion about can, what kind of insecurity, what kind of cells do we have, can we use these cells, and in which countries can they be used, what is the ethics and the scientific background for these cell lines. So there would be the avoidance of widespread use of 
of cells without ethical provenance information on it. There would also be a widespread use of cells without proper scientific characterization. And it's of course a waste of resources because we don't know which cells are available and cells which are there uh, don't need to be re-established if, if we have them already. So the registry was founded on, this, on these conditions. This was in 2007 and the conditions are still there but certain things changed. And, and um, the new challenges um, which come up is, are, are related to the establishment, for example, of large pluripotent stem cell banks, uh, which, and the, mainly the now commercialization of these cell lines, which is starting. So this requires new um, information on the registry and new functions. One is the promotion of standard, standards, of st uh, standards in quality of the cells, standards in ethical provenance, standards in nomenclature, for example. There's also a data protection issue which needs to be much broader considered now than it was seven years ago, especially with respect to genetic information on donors to protect re-identification of donors and of phenotypic data of the donors or of the cell, cell lines themselves. And there's um, more information on these cell lines needed. There's information on projects. Where are these cells uh, being used and what kind of feedback do we, can we gather from uh, the use of these cell lines and how can we inform the public about this information. Um, so first thing I wanted to um, introduce as a nomenclature which is one, one part of the standardization efforts of the registry. So there was a paper a few years ago on what could a, regist a, a nomenclature for pluripotent stem cells look like. We tried to implement them, and this is a uh, result. I think you have the old version of my presentation, uh, but I, I try to uh, go along with that. So the nomenclature con consists of several parts which are identifiers. So the first one is uh, the institution where the cell was derived. The second one is what kind of cell type is it, an iPS cell line or embryonic stem cell line or SC and T line and so on. Uh, and then comes a donor uh, number, an alphanumerical number, and these three components together are the basic identifier of the cell line, and then there comes additional information like how, which, uh, how many cell lines have been derived from this particular uh, donor and are there subclones of this particular cell line uh, available or not. <coughs> um, this is just... Uh, tree, a hierarchical tree of this nomenclature. So when we look at the um, landscape of uh, embryonic and pluripotent stem cell usage, we can first of all see that there's a steady increase in both, both fields. There are a steady, there's a steady increase of publications based on human embryonic stem cell lines. There's a steady increase on publications based on pluripotent IPS cell lines. And there's a certain overlap between both lines and this overlap is increasing. We analyzed that a little bit closer and we found, we analyzed this overlap a little bit closer and wanted to know how many uh, of these overlapping publications used embryonic stem cells just as a gold standard. And the number is decreasing. It's now about 25% of these publications use ES cell lines as a gold standard. Uh, and these cells are mainly H1 and H9 cells. There are two or three other cell lines, but this gold standard is based on just two cell lines, basically. Um, so what is, what is the other 75%? And the other 75% of usage of embryonic stem cells or iPS cell lines shows that there is a differentiation of fields which use either embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. Um, so embryonic stem cells are being used, for example, for basic research, uh, on, ontogeny research, and other aspects, also clinical research, uh, iPS cells very much into uh, in, uh, pharmacological and toxicological research and modeling. Um, I don't want to go too much. I think uh, in the interest of time, I want to close soon, but there are some... Um, this is how the registry website looks like. So you can search for cells, you can register a cell, 
cell line, you have to answer certain, you have to add certain information to be uh, uh, accepted as a, as a pluripotent stem cell line. There need to be ethical provenance, there need to be information, enough information to show that this is actually a pluripotent stem cell line, and there need, inf need to be information on the origin of the cell line. So then, when this is together, the information will be validated by a committee and then uh, publi published uh, or released for open, open access. So type and origin, as I mentioned, I, I just go through that. Ethical issues are being questions. And uh, these are much focused on the European um, requirements uh, for use of embryonic stem cells, which, which uh, states that sh there shouldn't be an incentive uh, for derivation of the, cell, the cells, and there's a big discussion, what is an incentive and what is just a compensation uh, for donation of material. They shouldn't be used, the cells shouldn't be used for reproductive purposes, and there shouldn't be a destruction of human embryos involved. This is for European Union funding, and each state and each country in the European Union have different laws, which are, of course, ap applicable as well. So we have information on the derivation of the cells and the characterization of the cells, um, and uh, yeah, with that, I think I close now, and uh, thank you again for your attention. Sorry, such a big room, and people are sitting all in the back. <laughs> So um, it's my pleasure to introduce ten, Dr. Tenil Ludwig from YCEL, who is going to take us um, looking at another approach of banking from a global perspective, but also with some feedback from YCEL institution itself. Thank you, Tenil. Thank you, Rosie. Ooh, sorry, a little uh, height impaired, so I have to bring this down a little bit so I can see you. Uh, and my slides. Um, thanks very much, Rosie, for the opportunity to present today uh, and for um, the forum for allowing the opportunity um, to talk a little bit about the International Stem Cell Initiative Banking Forum. I'm having trouble with it too. There we go. Um, I am based out of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this is beautiful downtown Madison, Wisconsin in the university setting. Uh, it doesn't look quite like that now. Picture it under about six inches of snow and you have a better idea. <clears throat> and YSL has just moved into new digs, so if you find yourself in the Madison area, you're certainly invited to come over for a tour. We'd love to have an opportunity to talk with you. YSL is most known for the stem cell bank that we operate for. We offer both research and clinical grade cell lines. Um, we were the first distributor of human IPS and ES cell lines globally, and our, con our collection currently contains the most widely used human ES and IPS cell lines. We offer them in a variety of platforms. We've made more than 4,000 distributions globally. To date, we've covered 600 institutions, more than 2,100 investigators, and more than 45 countries. 75% of our distributions are domestic, but we've had no problem reaching any of the countries that we've distributed to. And I probably wouldn't be allowed back in the office on Monday if I didn't mention that we are open to deposits. So if you have cell lines that you're looking for a global distributor for, please find me after this, and I would love to talk with you. But that's all the talking I'm going to do about YCEL, because I'm really here to talk about the International Stem Cell Banking Initiative. So our, <clears throat> the, our establishment as a bank is what led us to be involved with the International Stem Cell Banking Initiative. It was established by the International Stem Cell Forum, and it's a consortium of the leading pluripotent stem cell bankers globally. Uh, from a variety of countries, the U.S., the U.K., Canada, the European Union, Japan, China, Korea, and a number of other countries. And the purpose of this bank was in response to a lack of formal communication between the leading distributors in this area to create some consensus guidance documents or points to consider for any new groups looking to establish banking practices within their own country. So the bank, uh, the Forum has published three separate publications, where two have been published, one is in press to be published soon. The first was a consensus guidance on um, banking and characterization of human embryonic stem cell lines for use in research, and then a follow-up paper to that um, discussing IPS cells as well, and a new publication that will be out in early 2015 in regenerative medicine on banking and characterization of human pluripotent stem cell lines specifically for use in clinical applications. So 
I invite you to look forward to that as it comes out. The consensus guidance documents covers a number of different areas, the first being informed consent and traceability, overall general principles. Um, it discusses compliance with both national laws and looking forward to international regulations because we assume that groups are going to want to, uh, as they're generating product, be able to use it not only in their own country but have it available to other countries as well. Um, and to verify compatibility with all of those other principles. Some of those can be found at ISSCR and the paper will generate, will direct you to other resources as well. Some of the procedures to assist in ethical operations, particularly the need for independent oversight such as a stem cell research oversight committee and establishment of that in your area. And then the governance of supply, how you transfer it, the ethics that are required, um, how to put MTAs into effect, things like that. So banking process, particularly the procurement of the lines, um, how, what documentation is needed, how those procedures should be handled, quality control process, release process. It specifically discusses the need for a two-tier banking system to allow some savings uh, in testing between master cell banks and distribution lots. It also talks about microbiological testing, the risks involved, which tests should be done on all types of banks, um, test procedures, whether you do this type of testing on the master cell bank or on the distribution lots. Um, and the importance of being able to provide a material safety data sheet with any cell lines that you're transmitting to any end user. Characterization studies, including morphology and assessment for cell lines, uh, the characterizations that these organizations internationally considered important to be standard across lines that are being distributed, um, particularly uh, genetics, that they be as expected, and we intentionally don't say normal in this case because sometimes the genetics are not normal but they should be as you expect them to be, particularly in disease lines. That the cell lines be able to be defined as undifferentiated through marker expression and pluripotent, current gold standard is teratoma, but there are certainly a number of other assays that are coming on quickly. Release criteria is discussed at length, uh, and the consensus is that identity, sterility, bacterial, fungal, mycoplasma, karyotype, post-thaw recovery, antigen expression through undifferentiated marker expression, pluripotency, adventitious agent testing at least for human and potentially for other uh, animal strains based on how the cells were grown and growth characteristics should be done on any cell line that's distributed either on the master cell banks or on the distribution lots of material. And that end users should be provided with gene expression data and genetic stability information if it's available. The clinical application paper that will be coming out shortly also discusses additional information that will be applicable simply to the to the clinical grade materials, particularly compliance determinations, focusing on international standards with a wealth of information about regulations and how they differ from region to region, country to country, continent to continent. Um, donor selection, safety, ass <coughs> safety assessments, how best to perform those, cell line characterization and how it may differ for clinical application, quality assurance, uh, potential applications in terms of whether it be used for biologicals or for toxicology studies in the future uh, and how that may differ uh, in the way the cells are handled, treated, distributed, and maintained. So that's where I'm going to end. All of this work with the International Stem Cell Banking Initiative has been very graciously funded by the International Stem Cell Forum, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge them. The banking initiative is led by Glenn Stacy, but we also work in close collaboration with the other two forum partners. Um, the Standards and the Ethics Working Party. Sorry, the art challenge is here for so much room. Um, I, don't, I don't think Mahendra needs an introduction. We all know him and we all highly respect him, so Mahendra. <laughs> and you're probably tired of seeing me so often. But, um, I'm going to try and be very short. I'm going to just show two slides. But before I start, and the reason I can show only two slides is because you heard from Tinel and you heard from Andres about what banking really involves. So I just want to summarize what they said just very briefly before I go to the first slide. So they've told you that banking is critical. If you want to maintain something and you want to be able to test it and want to be able to repeat something that other people have done, you need to have access to cells. So somebody has to maintain them and has to maintain the history and the database that goes with it. So that's the critical piece of why you need banking. And you heard that there have been several initiatives to be able to do that. So why is banking also really important in today's context or in this session or why we're 
repeating this sort of thing since you already heard that there are banks and there are initiatives. And there are two reasons for this. It's because of science advancing rapidly and because we now have many more lines and cell types that we may want to bank. One, of course, is another pluripotent cell, just like the embryonic stem cell, which is the induced pluripotent cell, where you can make many, many lines and many, many thousands of lines have been made. But it's also true for adult stem cell populations. We've had to now consider banking of bone marrow and cord blood, which has been done in the past for specific uses. But now that we're expanding those uses, we have to now start reconsidering how we're going to bank things. So if I can have the first slide. Okay. So what you can see on the slide here is basically I want to remind people about what is the model for therapy and then sort of step back and then think about what banking would imply in this case. So the way we are now thinking about therapy is that pluripotent cells themselves are not used for therapy. Right? What you use is you take your pluripotent cells as a starting sample or input material in which you then differentiate into whatever cell type you want. The difference between an adult stem cell and a pluripotent cell is simply that you're going to take those cells and you can differentiate an induced pluripotent cell into many more things, but otherwise and conceptually for banking, it's about the same. So you can divide that whole process into three parts, right? You have some way you have to collect the tissue and you may want to bank the tissue so that you have a backup to be able to keep it for something. You will want to maybe use it and make yourself a master cell bank or a working cell bank of the undifferentiated cell. And that's going to be important because you need to have a stock of those cells for particular use. And then you're going to take that as input material in terms of differentiating it. And when you differentiate it, you're going to differentiate it each time for one product or into multiple products, depending on which starting cell you're going to use. So if, it's, if you were imagining this whole process in case of MSC, you would have a tissue biopsy from which you were going to make your MSC. You would expand them in, in maybe it's the quantum system that you heard about a couple of days ago, and you would have a bank of those cells. And then maybe you want to make bone, and you'll take that and differentiate it to make bone. Or maybe you want to make cartilage, or maybe you want to expand it and engineer it, and then that you'd have something along these lines. And then you'd finally ship it and store it. So lots of processes and lots of steps. Right? So what that means is that somehow you have to track things all the way through that process. You have to make sure that if this is not all done in the same site, that you know what's going to be done at one site and then make sure that you have processes to track it from one site to the other. And then when it gets to the surgical suite where that actual process of delivery occurs, that you can confirm that what the surgeon is given is the same as what you started with in the first place and so that you have a chain of custody that you can go back to in some fashion. And you know, when a surgeon is going to put something in and they know what the cell is, they have to choose which cell line they want. And that's where the patient history, et cetera, is going to become very important. And so they want to know that they chose the right cell line from all of the stuff that had been done, which has the right properties for the indication that they're going to use it for. So right away now you see that banking has become a little bit more complex, right? You're not just taking one cell type, you're not taking one cell line, and you're now doing it at once, not just one site. And with each case, there's more data and more documentation that you have to keep track of. So if we can have the next slide. Yes. So this is, I just want to make one point that has not been made by the other two speakers. And that's, it's been made in a bit of a part, but here I want to try and emphasize the one additional piece that one has to worry about when one thinks about banking. And that is data. Okay. And unlike data, which we normally talk about and what you heard about, there is actually like three types of data that you have to worry about in, in, in terms of thinking about what you're doing in a bank or you're thinking about using cells. And I, this is my personal way of classifying it. I'm not quite sure that there's a sort of accepted way of classifying it, so bear that in mind when I say it's three types of data. Maybe for other people it's all the same. But to me, there's a data which comes or is associated with the tissue. You collect the tissue, you have to have patient data, you have to have patient history, you have to know whether the cells were normal, you have to know whether the per person had an infection. That's all sort of I classified as patient data. And there's special rules to that kind of data because it's directly associated with a donor or a patient. And so there are HIPAA rules and there are medical rules applied to access to the data, searchability of the data, identification of that data, genomic information associated with that data. So I, I 
that's why I put it in a sort of separate bu bucket, right? Because this is not something that anybody can search. So there's an accessibility issue to that data that you have to also keep in mind when you're building a bank. Then there's a second piece, which probably is not as interesting to anybody, but I call it the cell line data. And the cell line data is, you know, you manufacture it. So every manufacturer needs to know what exactly happened during the process of manufacture. They need to know if there was a change or you deviated from the process so that you can keep track of it when you're manufacturing, particularly when you're manufacturing for CGMP grade material, et cetera. So that's the second piece of data. So that's the in-process testing data, the history of the line data, when did it enter a CGMP manufacturing facility, how did you bank it, where exactly in the minus 180 did you store it, or did you store it in liquid nitrogen chamber. All of that is a very important set of data. But it's not important for everybody. It's important for people who actually do the biobanking, who do the repository work, who have to trace it and have to maintain quality control. And then there's a third piece of data, and that's really important and we don't consider it that often, is that many of these lines which are banked will not be used just once. And that's the history that you collect and you've got a file and you can keep it. If it's manufactured as a manufactured product, there'll be a master cell bank, there'll be a working bank, and then there'll be a use history, right? You'll use the cells in one patient, maybe in a at allogenic fashion, you may use it in thousands of patients. By law for medical use, and, uh, and Scientifically, it's very important that if you use it in certain kind of assays or certain kind of discoveries, that you have that kind of history that's collected in one place so that you can choose the right kind of line that you're using and you have the right regulatory requirements of being able to report adverse events with the cell line or being able to follow the history of how it behaved in one patient versus it behaved in another patient because that's a legal requirement, right, in being able to do it on clinical use. So that is what I call a use data set. And that use data set is something that you have to have widely available for people. And it goes with the cell line in terms of being able to use it. So, so this is something that people don't appreciate as much, is that when you're thinking about data that goes with a registry or a bank, and now you start thinking about both academic use and clinical use, that you really are thinking about three types of data sets. And all three type of data sets have to be collected in common, but those databases have to be maintained with some kind of barrier between each other but linked in an appropriate way so that access is there. So the last piece I'll say in this slide, and I'll shut up, I guess, is that there is some experience on keeping these sort of separate data sets in, in the past. And so we can learn from those sorts of separate data sets. But to my knowledge, it's not all in a sort of repository that we can point to and say this is what's been done each time, because the repositories where cells have been used for therapy are one-off. Uh, repository. So cord blood is used once with one patient or bone marrow is used once and that bone marrow sort of history is done with and you don't have to maintain this sort of last database. And the places where you've had to do this for a long period of time or look at multiple patients that have been used and keep the sort of use data has been with small molecule drugs where you have to maintain that kind of data for adverse event reporting and for lot to lot manufacture but it's a little bit different than the kind of data that you uh, keep here. So we have to marry those sorts of experiences to put together something that will be particularly useful, but it will be required and should be sort of part of planning when we start thinking about databases, registries, and banks. Thanks. And last but not least, Professor Zachrach from Mayo Clinic. He will talk also about the issue of banking in his context. Uh, thank you to the organizers and uh, Rosie for moderating today's session. Um, I think what I have here is the case study for the exact examples Tanil and Mahandra introduced as far as an institution's attempt to actually encapsulate all these features of what a biobank is not only responsible for to its patients, but responsible to uh, its investigators and uh, the community as a whole as we move forward with the biobank. I represent the BioTrust, which is one of the platforms for the Mayo Clinic Center for Regenerative Medicine. Physically, we are a biorepository. Um, 
but more importantly, we are a group of technicians, of nurses, of study coordinators that interacts with our Mayo Clinic um, investigators and clinicians to not only interact with patients, but to collect samples that serve as the biomaterials for regenerative medicine research at Mayo Clinic. Um, we also function as the portal by which investigators can inter interact with Mayo uh, to access these samples. Uh, and along with the Mayo Clinic's uh, Center for Regenerative Medicine consult service, which is the portal by which patients can interact with the Mayo Clinic to get information on regenerative medicine. And the goal of, of why we were set up, and I'll say we were only set up about a year and a half ago, was to increase the rate at which we're translating our research uh, to therapies for our patients, both at Mayo Clinic as an institution, uh, but also nationally. Mayo Clinic, um, probably about five years ago, set up three areas or centers of excellence. Uh, we are one of them, of the regenerative medicine, but they also set up individualized medicine and a center for healthcare delivery. And as a Center for Regenerative Medicine, uh, Dr. Terzik, our uh, director, uh, formulated a, a system by which we weren't a physical entity, but a group by which we worked with various departments and became um, intercalated into their systems and procedures and how they do things. So rather than being a physical presence at the institution, we work with departments and, and try and foster regenerative therapies in a variety of areas, whether it be uh, OBGYN, uh, plastics, uh, surgery, things like that. As far as the blueprint that we've set up, uh, it is trying to connect um, the clinic and what the patients need as far as therapies, uh, moving from palliative care to uh, actual regeneration and curing disease, um, and affecting that uh, to the patient through procedures and how we treat patients. The BioTrust functions as a translational platform by which this happens. And the idea was when we were set up a year and a half ago that um, stem cells, mostly IPS cells right now in our facility, but also um, MSCs serve that function. So that blueprint involves, like I said, a variety of departments. Mostly we work within the um, Center for Regenerative Medicine consult service to obtain our samples. For the most part, that's dermal punch biopsies. Uh, we also get specimens from the ORs uh, during the times of surgery. In interested investigators will contact us and we'll obtain the specimens. Uh, we are also uh, actively pursuing the use of MSCs derived from uh, cord and also the placenta as far as an overall uh, bioinsurance type system where uh, parents can actually archive these samples. Right now it's for research purposes, but in the future may be possible for uh, GMP production. I'll go into these details, uh, what the Bio uh, Trust actually functions as in detail here in a second. But again, we're trying to increase the rate of discovery uh, through the generation in the biobank of providing IPS, sales, uh, IPS cells to our investigators across our campus. Uh, to increase the translation of therapies and uh, apply that to patient care. To date, uh, like I said, we've been uh, an actual physical entity for about a year and a half. We've, uh, in conjunction with our other Mayo investigators, generated about 150 patient-specific IPS lines, three or four clones for each. We've completely characterized those using many of the mechanisms that Tennille highlighted earlier, um, and we'll go through those in just a bit. Um, and we've also uh, generated a number of fibroblast lines that have yet to be turned into IPS cells. Uh, we've also collected uh, both tissue and blood from about 20, 250 births over the past year and a half for the isolation of biomaterials related to regenerative medicine uh, therapies. Um, our services, um, like Mahandra said, to try and keep everything under one umbrella and for data management purposes. Mayo's also started a spin-off company that's uh, in Rochester that is involved in the reprogramming services for the fiber baths. So we're able to maintain the uh, chain of custody and the data. Uh, we've also begun the development of differentiated, um, directed differentiation to different various cell types, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And uh, we're also involved in the training of people at Mayo Clinic. IPS is still a relatively new field where um, 
like I'm sure Tanil can ver uh, verify with YSL, a lot of people think they can handle YSL uh, IPSLs or anybody else's IPSLs, but it's, it's something completely different to maintain these, propagate them, and, and do differentiation. So part of our process is training our investigators to use them properly um, and maintain their uh, pluripotency. And again, uh, what we hope to do is increase novel development of diagnostics, therapeutics, also foster clinical trials. We've got a number of clinical trials going on at Mayo using adipose-derived MSCs. Uh, we're looking at in the future uh, as the FDA and uh, as the science develops, uh, as that develops into the IPS field as well. And again, uh, what our goal affecting patient care. So the BioTrust provides a number of services uh, to Mayo Clinic investigators. Um, the, the BioTrust is also a portal to outside investigators that might want to tap into this, and, that, and we are the portal for that. Um, project design, so that's developing uh, projects, uh, whether that's at the back end, wanting to know what differentiated cell types can be developed, uh, but also identifying patients. Uh, we'll develop IRB protocols that allow for the consent and sharing of IPS cells, either within the institution or outside. Um, we interact, we actually do the consenting of patients, um, and we work with our consult service uh, to talk to patients as far as overall education uh, of the stem cells and what they're agreeing to as far as a research project. Uh, the specimen collection, whether it's a punch biopsy, um, excess OR tissue, or collected within the birthing center. We do all the QC ourselves at Mayo, um, and we also, like I said, have a reprogramming service with a Mayo Associated company. Uh, we have the bank itself. Uh, we've got two facilities, one for our primary bank and one for redundant storage. Uh, and we also have a process by, by which all of our data is maintained within our institution. Um, all those data that Mahandra talked about, not only with the original tissue type, so the patient-specific information that's collected with our SDMS service, uh, but also the samples themselves within our limbs. And then we have an oversight committee regulating the distribution of these cells through our institution. Uh, through a review process and a scroll uh, board. So like I said, uh, we offer services through our uh, nurses and clinical coordinators uh, to interact with our patients, gain consent. We'll also sit down with investigators. IPS is a relatively new field. A lot of investigators have heard about it but don't really know the capabilities of it. Um, I'll sit down with them and talk about, you know, what are your expectations at the end of the day. You want IPS cells, but you want to break, make breast endothelial cells. That may not be a differentiation protocol that's uh, well developed, so we'll talk about what their real needs are. We'll talk about the actual cost. Um, we've got a large um, fund that we use to uh, generate IPS cells, but we definitely direct what type of diseases we're looking at as far as development. We also develop the consent that will allow these samples to be shared. It's critical that what BioTrust involvement uh, allows access to these cells uh, to Mayo Clinic investigators and possibly those outside. Again, through the consult service, we educate our patients, uh, gain consent. We'll actually do the dermal punch biopsies uh, within the consult service. We also collect the excess OR tissue. Also, in the birthing center, we'll collect the placenta and the cord and the cord blood uh, for the isolation of cells. So we isolate the somatic cells. We either store those or we pass them on to um, Regen, which is our Mayo associated company um, that does a reprogramming service. So we provide the fibroblast to Regen. They send us back all the bio, uh, biomaterial that we sent along with IPS cells. Um, everything sent over is de-identified. No clinical information is provided to Regen. It's maintained within the BioTrust. We also do the isolation of uh, mononuclear cells, either by CPAX or FICAL gradient, depending upon the product need. Um, and then we do the isolation of MSCs from both the cord and placenta. QC services we'll do. We do the traditional uh, markers for pluripotency cells. We do the karyotyping and mycoplasma testing. We'll also do some novelty scoring using pluritest. 
Um, we do the directed differentiation, the ecto, endo, and mesoderm. Uh, I'll stop here just to mention, we do this for all the lines that come through our facilities. So these are part of the COAs that provided our in investigators each time they look at our list to see if they might want to use our cells. Bottom panel is um, a scorecard, a life technologies product, which um, analyzes by QP, QTPCR, um, non-directed differentiation, kind of replacing the teratoma formation. And then we also do some direct differentiation for investigators, RPE cells, NSC, insulin producing cells, brown adipocytes. And then on the bottom we have uh, cardiomyocyte differentiation that we've done in the past um, for specific investigators. Our QC has done the same for the MSCs. We'll do the flow. We'll also differentiate to fat, bone, and chondrocytes. And then we maintain these in our facility. Uh, we've developed specific apps to interact with our RLM system to record samples uh, by the uh, technicians within the hood themselves. We provide redundant storage for investigators in Scottsdale and Jacksonville across our enterprise uh, to maintain the security of our samples. And then we also pu publish these intra-clinic-wise, uh, um, the availability of these cells. And we hope to do is not only increase the use of IPS cells, we hope to decrease the cost by sharing uh, control samples so that an investigator, instead of having to determine, find 10 controls and 10 disease patients, we can find a common set of controls, which greatly reduces the cost. Um, is very important to us. It also sets up those collaborations. As big as an institution as Mayo is, we can bring investigators from two completely different fields that might be willing to work together. At the same time, for those people that might be at another academic institution or biopharma, um, through communicating with the Biotrust, we can put together people that might have um, an interest. Right now, our distribution is, li is limited to our institution. You can't see this from the outside looking in, um, and there are various reasons for that, but um, as long as you work with the Biotrust and the Mayo Clinic investigator, we can address IRB issues with sharing. Um, we have an oversight committee, so anybody who wants to use our IPSLs, even in, within our own institution, they fill out an application online. I'll interview them, make sure that their ideas of what they'd like to do with these cells are actually a capability. And then this oversight committee reports back to the SCRO um, for the institution. And again, we provide training for all of our um, IPS users so that they're used properly and we're not continually just re, um, sending them out for them to reuse. This has led to a number of projects just within the last year at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Mike Ackerman has uh, done cardiomyocyte differentiation and patch clamping for long QT syndrome. We have got an ALS project. We've got an inherited eye disease project. We've got Tim Nelson and his hypoplastic left heart syndrome. All of these are done by using IPSCs derived at Mayo Clinic. Uh, insulin producing type 1 diabetes studies. We've got MS studies uh, ongoing from the MS patients looking at the immune response. Uh, Dr. Weigel, who is actually our medical advisor, is developing um, re endothelialization of lung tissues uh, and recell D cell projects. And then Dr. Zhang and uh, Dr. Staff are working at peripheral neurons and peripheral neuropathy. So I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Rosie will moderate any questions. Anybody who wants to ask a question, we have plenty of time for um, debate and discussion. And I know you have given a lot of information here, but you have the kind of, kind of the bankers and, and stuff. So while we see them, there's no question. I'm going to answer one question. I don't want to ask a question, I'm going to answer a question. Where Andres says it was a Spanish woman who rejected the change of the European Autonomous Registry. I just want to say he was not me. I'm the police advisor, but that Spanish woman was me. I saw some faces pointing at me. So I don't have questions for the members. I was to pose a question to the speakers. You want to talk about the challenges of going and using I'm using a biorepository as a real resource for clinical isolation. If we forecast in the future, in the next five to ten years, what do you think will be your main your challenge? Main challenge? And each and of each you can you give me your, your, your own perspective, perspective from your own, your own work. work and connecting it. Maybe I, maybe I, because I am a clinical center, it really is 
right now, right now, educating, educating shows up the capabilities. capabilities. It, is, it, is it is the key. A lot of them have heard buzzwords, a lot of them have heard diseases, things like that. You know, IPSLs aren't in trials, and diseases aren't in trials, and diseases aren't in trials, and diseases aren't in but introducing, introducing the abilities of what, what, what an IPS cell is, is capable of, of based, based on where it's coming, it's coming starting the material, and also, you know, the, the capability the of differentiation, differentiation which, 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 which you can, what is drug screening, screen, screen, diagnostics, or, or what have you. So, so. Investigators, investigators conceptually understand, understand there's a really, really basic science that's not bench, bench, teaching them what they do, and it's really important. Thank you. I'm just trying to explain. Well, for me, it's only <laughs> two issues. One is to define, define to provide the right size to work in a therapy, and to, to really establish a mode of action for the, for the we're talking here about uh, put and stem cell derived cell types. And the second issue is, which have been brought up several times in this uh, meeting, it's regulation, the regulatory issues which need to be solved and uh, standardization issues. Uh, funding. Yeah, frankly, uh, a lot of the funding sources seem to be drying, drying up more and more. Um, the funding um, through the NIH specifically for uh, infrastructure, um, for banking, uh, and for non-hypothesis driven projects is harder and harder to come by. Um, and I, I, I want to take a minute to thank you personally for all the work that you did to make sure that this has been funded up to this point, and we're going to miss you at the NIH. But we're happy you found a place uh, in New York. Um, I, I wish you were back in Washington. Uh, um, because a lot of these cell lines that are being generated, they're all going to be very important, particularly the disease models that are coming up. But not all of the disease models that are going to be important to have are going to be widely used. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what stem cell banks are going to be doing is curation rather than distribution. And unless you're distributing, there's no revenue coming in. So there has to be funding for the curation of these lines for uh, future use. So thanks, Janelle. And I think she's alluding to one very important thing about the government playing a role in regulations. And I'm not going to say something positive or negative, but I'm going to point out one big issue for biobanking, which Janelle sort of alluded to, and that's what I call the law of unintended consequence. So what's happened with biobanking is there's initially a lot of excitement, and the government says, we're going to do this. And all the academics say, great, and you know, you should really make every, everything available free. And so the government says, great, we're going to provide this money, and everything is going to be available free. I mean, for example, with the y -cell lines, the cost was subsidized when they were initially distributed. So this has two un unintended consequences. So one, investigators expect it to be available free, and so they will be sloppy in what they do, and often they say, oh, well, we can just call up Vicel and get more lines, you know, and Vicel will provide the lines because there's an incentive to do that. On the other hand, there's another huge problem, is that there's no commercial advantage to any company entering a field. So there, there's actually a competitive marketplace which can then drive the prices down. So if you notice, there is no competitive commercial repository that provides cells that exists for other cell types, but doesn't exist for embryonic stem cells, doesn't exist for IPSC, et cetera, that's the case. So that's been a huge problem. It would not be a problem if the government continued funding. But what happens when the government withdraws funding, right? Suddenly there's no competition and it becomes very difficult for people to be able to then distribute lines. And I know Janelle's gone through that herself in uh, when the government stopped funding the Vicel Bank and they had to really scramble to figure out how they could distribute cells. So to me, that's sort of a huge problem that we have to always be very careful about is how do you set up a repository which is self-sustaining when you don't have funding or the lines themselves are not that widely used, right? There are many lines which are useful for a few investigators, but then not that widely used or not widely available. A second important experience that I had in terms of biobanking, which I see is a really major challenge, is what I call this irrational exuberance of patent filing, right? And what has happened is that the patent holders, I mean, I, I think it's an important thing to file patents and it's important to have discoveries, so don't get me wrong here. But many of the people who have filed these patents have simply assumed that if you, even if you have a non-profit biobank, which is a repository which is doing it as a function 
which is biologically, you know, sort of important for academics, they consider them a commercial entity and they want royalty payments and huge uh, fees for allowing people to distribute the lines. And there is no way that a non-profit repository can have that kind of money or support to be able to do it. And here's the issue which sort of ties in with the first issue, is the government doesn't fund patent fees when you have to distribute in a repository. So they just say it's your problem, right? So now we've had that experience when we worked with uh, the Vicel repository, we've had that experience with Courier, that there are many lines that we made which include certain technology, either it's gene engineering or editing technology or a reporter line, which we can't distribute because they say you can only distribute from your lab, where I can't maintain the quality control, but I can't give it to a non-profit repository to distribute on my behalf. So to me, those seem to be like really major challenges. Absolutely, and one of the, the, the pieces always miss in the discourse about how important it is to assure the sustainability of this effort is that it respects participants' interest. Participants contribute to a resource like a biobank, contribute with the samples in the data for basic to clinical research um, with the only benefit at the end of contributing to scientific progress. So a lot of questions I have for policymakers and from funders and research is, if you not assure the, sus the sustainability of these resources, you are forgetting you are not respecting the donors. This is the reciprocity. That's what they get back. We advance science. And we open repositories that we have to close later because there were no resources provided. We are violating that covenant. Then we promise this reciprocity. And I think it's something that we should take more into consideration. And it should be part of the discourse. As education is important, as financing and standardization, etc., is don't forget the other piece of the puzzle. Right? I think that provides a more holistic perspective. Um, do I get any questions from, from the speakers? So I'm going to pose another question. Um, I think people are a bit shy and, 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 and tired. Is the issue of regulations. You know, one of the, the things that when talking about biorepositories and biobankings and even the registries is the forgetting how complex when we talk about regulation, the, map, the policy map work looks. We are not only talking of FDA you know, administrative type regulations, but also the basic one that governs how you collect the samples in different jurisdictions, how you share the samples, and how, and the issue of privacy, identifiability that Andres alluded early, is another thing we forget. We understand protecting privacy just as I will not um, share your clinical information, I will hold information of the line and line, but there's other complex issues that occur in the genomic context then we'll come here. So what other challenge in terms of regulation do you encounter in your practice? Um, but in, more than regulation, I will say in terms of overall policy for any of the panelists that would like to, to answer to this. And I'm talking about the whole research cycle, not only in, on, in your banking. We leave that with our investigators. Mm -hmm. So we've got 150 patient specific IPS lines. I would say 100 of them have complete genome sequencing. I do not maintain that in our database. That is maintained by the investigator who either submitted the samples under which their IRB was used to get the sample, what have you. Um, as, a, as a policy, we don't want to house that information. That's a specific mm -hmm. investigator who enrolled the patient for a specific reason. Um, we limit ourselves to very limited demographics, ICD-9 codes, things like that with, that, would, that would be with a patient. Um, with a tissue. Um, we don't ask our investigators to, um, so if, I, if, if we share an IPS line to an investigator, we don't request any return of data. Um, I know our bio bank, which is basically, we're the bio trust, which is cells. The bio bank is genome sequencing, so randomized genome. Um, they ask for the return of data so that things aren't duplicated. We don't do that currently. So mm -hmm. we not are, are not a source of data on any specific patient. So that's how we try to avoid that context. Um, I'm speaking for the registry, for the uh, pluripotent stem cell registry, and we try to provide as much information on, on the cells as possible so the user can make made an informed decision on which cells to use, to order or to use. And this information includes donor 
phenotype disease data, and it also includes genetic data. So the problem is how to access this data and at the same time provide confidentiality or pro protect uh, the individual who donated the uh, samples and data. So there are several models now uh, proposed. One model is a very restrictive one that in order to get genetic information, you need to get to a data access committee and this committee then decides whether you can have access to the data or not. Uh, same for clinical information, uh, where you have to go through a data access committee. Another model would be that the registry, for example, global registry or a registry of a bank says, okay, we have the data, you guarantee that these data are not being misused and then you can have access to these data. So which model will be prevail is uh, one of one, at one, on one end an ethical question because the donation of the data is an altruistic donation and is being made to make use of the cells and of the data. And the other one is a more protective avenue where you protect more, as, as much as possible access to the data and control it. I guess in terms of regulations, the thing that uh, has made it really difficult for us in practical work is that the regulations are different in different countries. So for us, shipping cells from one place to the other has become very difficult because the kind of documentation we need or what we need to be able to send is not clear. And then there are certain worries that people have because of their patent rights which have not been filed in certain countries so then they don't want to, us to send the cells there because they don't know what people will do in that particular country. And then there are Department of Agriculture regulations which we have to worry about because it's human material. And then there are defense of genetic integrity acts in different countries in terms of keeping uh, genetic information uh, private which are very different in different countries. So it's amazing, I can't transship through certain countries because the rule says that it can't land in a port when, when you're shipping a cell from one place to the other. And then I have to know serum exposure, which country that the serum which the cells were grown in was present or not, because when I store the IPSC or ESC, if they had been exposed to a certain kind of serum, then I can't ship it to a particular country. So it's, it, I would love it if there was some kind of clear uniform international regulation which said that these are the cells, these are all the rules you have to follow, and it was all in one place, and then one could uh, do something about it.